We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. Three young singers who soared to the heights of show business on the current rock and roll craze were killed today in the crash of a light plane in an Iowa snow flurry. The singers were identified as Richie Valen, 17, Buddy Holly, 22, and J.P. Richardson, known professionally as the Big Bopper. On February 2nd, 1959, between the hours of 8 p.m. and midnight, Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, and J.P., the Big Bopper Richardson, would play their final performance. The performance took place in Clear Lake, Iowa, and in addition to the three performers I just mentioned were also Dion and the Belmonts, as well as Frankie Sardo. They played for 1,500 people and the price of admission was $1.25, but everyone who was on the tour would remember it as the tour from hell as there was no sense to the routing. It just had the musicians zigzagging back and forth across the Midwest in freezing temperatures on defunct or repurposed school buses that no one was comfortable on. Dion DiMucci from Dion and the Belmonts remembers. The bus breaks down, the heater breaks down, and it is freezing. Freddie's in the middle of the, uh, the aisle with his uh, Johnny Walker and his gun. You want a shot or you want to get shot? Some guys were so cold they wanted to, you know, burn newspaper in the aisles of the bus. But these attempts would prove futile when nearly everyone began to come down with some sort of sickness or worse, get frostbite, such as Buddy Holly drummer Carl Bunch, who had to be hospitalized. But due to his misfortune, it would have been really cool to see Buddy Holly and Richie Valens taking turns playing drums for each other during their final performances. Buddy was only 22 years old and the most up and coming on the tour, but he had had it with the conditions on the bus and decided he was gonna charter a plane. So when he arrived at the surf ballroom, it was the owner, Carol Anderson, that put him in contact with Dwyer Flying Service, where he originally booked the plane for himself and his two bandmates, Waylon Jennings and Tommy Alsup, for $36 per passenger, which is like $356 today. For them to fly from Clear Lake, Iowa to Fargo, North Dakota, just to get some rest, do some laundry, and get picked up by the tour group the next day. When he heard about the plane, the Big Bopper asked Waylon Jennings for his spot because he was feeling terrible and he was a big man and was very uncomfortable on the bus. Waylon said this. Uh, I remember coming here and getting off the bus and going into a, a room and there were a lot of chairs lined up. Buddy had told me that he had chartered the plane for me and him and Tommy also. That's where we, the Big Bopper came over. He had the flu real bad and was feeling terrible. He said, I gotta get some rest. He said, would you let me have your seat on the plane? I said, it's okay with Buddy, it's okay with me. And I heard later that Tommy and, and Richie flipped coins. In turn, when Richie Valens found out that Waylon had given up his spot on the plane, he began relentlessly asking Tommy Ossip for his spot. For the rest of the evening, he would ask Tommy Ossip for his spot on the plane. It wasn't until Tommy had to go back inside really quick and check to make sure they got everything that Richie Valens asked him one last time for his spot on the plane. And Tommy Alsop's story goes like this. The con toss. It happened right in that doorway right over there. Right. I went upstairs to check the stage, see if there's anything left. And uh, Richie was standing there and he said, you gonna let me fly? And I pulled out a 50 cent piece and flipped it. And uh, he called the heads so. I went back out to the station wagon and told Buddy that Richie would be fine in my place if we'd tossed a call and he won. Buddy and Richie used the phone at the surf ballroom to call home. You can still go touch that phone today. And afterwards, Tommy also gave Buddy Holly his wallet so that Buddy could receive a package for him in Fargo or Moorhead, Minnesota, where they were going. And then he walks over to Waylon and he says, I hope your old bus freezes up which prompted Waylon to joke back, well, I hope your old plane crashes. They laugh at each other's jokes and part ways, and it's a memory that would come to haunt Waylon for the rest of his life. The three frontmen arrived at the Mason City Municipal Airport around midnight 40 in the morning. They were greeted by 21-year-old pilot Roger Peterson and directed to the Beechcraft 35 Bonanza. They loaded their things in. Buddy Holly sat up front with the pilot, Next in the rear behind the pilot was the big bopper and then Richie Valens kind of squeezed in beside the very large 
JP Richardson and was behind Buddy Holly on the plane. It's worth noting that 40 hours before the flight, the Beechcraft Bonanza had received a full overhaul and was ready to do work. Eight hours before the flight, so just as Buddy had booked it, Pilot Roger Peterson had contacted the air traffic communication station on three separate occasions to get a weather update and to make sure that he was going to be good to go. The weather only changed marginally during this time, so he was still confident in making the flight. On the runway, Roger Peterson would make a fourth and final call to the ATCS, but they would fail to inform him that the weather ceiling had dropped several thousand feet and that there was a severe weather warning in effect. The plane took off at midnight 55 and made a 180 degree turn with no problem and ascended to 800 feet. Peterson was supposed to file his flight plan as soon as he took off, but when he failed to do so and attempts to reach him failed, they knew something was gravely wrong. Though Peterson was an experienced pilot and a flight instructor, he was not certified to fly by instrumentation. He had passed a written exam and had training using navigational instruments, but during the overhaul, the gyro that he would have used to get the false horizon had been refitted with something he was unfamiliar with. Peterson entered the complete darkness of a snow flurry, and when he tried to use his navigational instruments, he, he couldn't make sense of the new gyro, and that caused him to pilot the wing of the aircraft into the ground at nearly 200 miles an hour. This subsequently caused the fuselage to strike the ground at a 90 degree angle and then cartwheel about 600 feet until it stopped. The three musicians were thrown from the plane as none of them were wearing seatbelts, and the pilot Roger Peterson remained entombed within the cockpit. The cause of death was massive blunt force trauma, and according to the autopsy reports, it was a very gruesome death. After an extensive search, the wreckage was found around 9.35 in the morning. It was a motionless scene, dusted in snow. The Civil Aeronautics Board determined that it was the pilot's unwise decision to embark on a flight which would necessitate flying solely by instruments when he was not properly certified or qualified to do so. While researching this story, I learned that Buddy Holly had a gun on board. He had this gun because he handled lots of cash for his band, this is in the days way before digital currency, and he wanted something to protect himself. But because that gun had been fired, this raised the question that maybe the Big Bopper, since he was so far away from the plane crash, maybe he survived the initial impact. And the other question it raised was maybe Buddy Holly tried to hijack the plane. No. 48 years? After he was buried, JP, the Big Bopper Richardson, was exhumed and given an autopsy because the family wanted to know, did he survive the initial impact and was he shot? The answer is this. From the top of the skull to the bottom of the feet, there are probably 200 fractures in that body. Both legs broken across and, um, fractures of the skull and the face and so forth. There's no way that he could have survived. And there's no indication of a gunshot wound. The second thing the exhumation of the Big Bopper afforded was his son, Jay Richardson, was able to say hello to his father for the very first time. Jay was born after his father died in this tragic plane crash and Despite being deceased for 48 years and some bluing, the Big Bopper was remarkably preserved. Richie Valens was only 17, but he had two songs on the radio, La Bamba and Donna. Donna got some recognition for, you know, actually being the girl that a song was about. In the Cerro Gordo County Coroner's Report, it's reported that Richie Valens died wearing a silver bracelet bearing the name Donna. If you're interested in cemetery tourism, Richie Valens is buried at the San Fernando Mission Catholic Cemetery in Los Angeles, California. Buddy Holly is buried at the Lubbock City Cemetery in Lubbock, Texas. Giles P. Richardson is buried at the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Beaumont, Texas. You can also take tours of the Surf Ballroom 
and visit the crash location in Clear Lake, Iowa. The importance of these three musicians is about more than the gruesome demise of youth. To quote journalist James Stafford, when musicians who write the soundtracks to our lives pass away, all of the times that we relate to that music come rushing back. So when I hear that'll be the day, or hello baby, or para bailar la bamba, I'm taken back to growing up with my grandparents and listening to them talk about the rebellious youth and rock and roll and American graffiti, if you will, like the culture that was sparked by the passing of these three individuals. Don McLean is famous for writing a song about this plane crash. It's called The Day the Music Died, but the music has done anything but die. Four young lives unfortunately ended in the plane crash, but they paved the way for so many things. The Beatles, Bob Dylan, and the list could go on and on forever. When the buses arrive later in the day on February 3rd, 1959, the surviving musicians decided that they were gonna finish the tour in memory of their fallen friends. That does it. If I misspoke or left anything out, let me know about it in the comments. You guys are so great about doing that. Let me know what your favorite songs are by these guys. I can honestly say that I've taken the time and spent with the music and it it's so good. I, I heard that'll be the day and every day and like the popular songs by these individuals. But when you actually put on a Buddy Holly album, you can listen to every single song from start to finish and everyone is great. And it's the same thing with Richie Valens. There's just something that's really, really special and unique and timeless about the music of the late 50s. The first generation of rock and roll. I'm the Appalachian son. Time waits for no man.